May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Word of God we're considering this morning is the Gospel lesson you heard earlier. I'm going to read just part of that and add the last few verses, Jesus' dialogue with the, the people of Jerusalem there. So I'm, I'm beginning at uh, verse 35. It says this, They brought it, that's the donkey, to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and, and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, have you ever thought about the ironies and paradoxes of Palm Sunday and Holy Week and, and given pause and considered what they mean? I can imagine some are probably thinking, uh, Pastor, those are big literary terms and it's been a long time since I was in school. What is a paradox? What is an irony? An irony is when something happens that we would not have expected. So it's an unexpected event. And sometimes it's even the opposite of what we would have expected. A paradox is when two opposite truths can be true at the same time. Uh, again, that sounds strange, they, but they don't contradict each other. They complement each other, and that's why we call it a paradox, not a contradiction. So now that you kind of maybe got your memory refreshed on that, let's go back and I'm going to address the first Palm Sunday paradox, and that's this. The humble Jesus received a welcome fit for a king, or we could put it this way, that... Uh, Amid the fanfare of Palm Sunday, Jesus was steeped in humility. That, again, you might say, well, that kind of seems like an irony, but to me, we'll get to the irony. But that's also a paradox. In the, in the Near East, it was common, really, for kings, dignitaries, rulers to ride donkeys. We have evidence of that from sources outside of Scripture, but we also have evidence within the Scripture that some of the kings and the prophets and the judges in the Old Testament rode donkeys. Now Luke, in his gospel, doesn't mention the palm branches. We know that from the other gospel writers. But palm branches were sort of makeshift banners. You know, they didn't run down to fast signs or they didn't go to the UPS store or the office depot to have a sign printed. What they did was they'd clip a palm branch and, and hold that up. That was a, like a banner them. And then the garments thrown in a pathway, well, you probably figure that out. That was the way you honored a dignitary, a ruler. It's sort of like our red carpet today. So in all of these ways, these people were honoring the one who was riding in on this donkey. And they were also shouting that word, Hosanna, which, as you know, means save us now. And all of that was just you might say in some respects, that was kind of over the top, right? You wouldn't have expected that to happen on any number, any day, especially the day after the Sabbath, that they would make such a fanfare, and then you look at the guy riding on it, 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 well, it hardly seems humble, does it? I mean, he, 
Jesus receives a welcome fit for any king of the day. It hardly seems humble, and yet it was. Now, Jesus really is a king, and he admits as much to Pilate just a few days later. But see, what puzzled Pilate and what puzzles so many Palm Sunday onlookers is that Jesus doesn't look like a king. In fact, Isaiah tells us he is not some chiseled, you know, wildly handsome Hollywood kind of guy. But he's pretty normal and, mm, let's say, not attractive. In other words, he wouldn't have stood out in a crowd because of the way he looked. But then you add to that that he's this guy and he's just wearing his regular clothes, his everyday clothes, as he's riding in on a donkey. I suppose that probably happened all the time, and yet they were hailing him as a king. And he doesn't have any royal robes that he's wearing, no crown on his head, not a scepter in his hand. Why, there's not even a halo over his head. There's no glory emanating from his being. There are no legions of angel armies marching ahead or following behind. There, there are no angel brass choirs blowing a trumpet fanfare. All of that would have been fitting for the kind of king Jesus really is. And as a little aside, when he comes the second time, you'll get all of that and more, okay? But when he comes into Jerusalem, this side, that's it. He gets a, a welcome fit for an earthly king. But as St. Paul told us in his letter to the Philippians, well, Jesus set aside. He, he chose to set aside the full-time display and use of his glory. He chose and said to humble himself. When God came to us, when our king came to us, he, he hid himself under humility. He came to us as a human being, but he humbled himself by doing that through birth to a, a mother, a virgin mother. He humbled himself, as St. Paul says, by not, not just entering as an infant and being helpless like a baby, but by taking on the very role of a servant. And so the king comes to us as our servant. There's the humility. In this way, we'd say this. God hid himself in humility so that he could carry out his intended purpose, which was to serve the world by saving the world. And, and yet, the Bible tells us that this humble Jesus had frequently revealed his glory in miracles. In, in the many miracles that he, he performed, Jesus reveals really who he is. He reveals just a, a glimpse of his divine glory. He did this, however, though, not to amass a, a, a following of raving fan fanatics, he, he didn't do that to uh, win an election. He didn't do it because he had planned to foment some rebellion against the local rulers. He did it instead to reveal to the world that their God was now living with them. And that he was living with them to save them from even greater evil, even greater sickness, even greater slavery, greater death than perhaps they would think of on a normal, you know, earthly level. His miracles were done to draw attention to his words. St. Luke tells us that the people gathered and shouted their praises and lifted the palm branches and scattered the garments in the way because of the miracles they had witnessed, they had seen. It, in spite of that, though, it seems, at least for, for many of them, that those miracles didn't wake them to the truth that God was now with them, that God had come to be with them to save them. And so as I, I, I started this, I'm going to remind you that the paradox of Palm Sunday is that amid the fanfare, amid all this celebration, Jesus is steeped in humility. In fact, what we learn through the passion history of Jesus is this, that many people ignored his miracles 
and rejected him precisely because of his humility. Misguided as many of them may have been on that particular Palm Sunday, they were still all too happy to welcome some king, some king with, who would come then and then exercise some power and you know, get the people around him and lead a rebellion against the, the foreign invaders who had served as their tyrants, right? They were looking for a king to deliver them from their earthly uh, slavery to earthly, these outside governments. They wanted a king who would come in might and who would restore the glory of their nation, who would reestablish the boundaries. And no doubt there were a few, if not many, in the crowd that day who were expecting Jesus still to do that. While the people may have been a little bit misguided about that kind of a king, the Pharisees and the leaders of the Jewish people had long given up that hope with Jesus. They'd seen his miracles too. They had heard his words, in fact. They just flat out rejected him because they knew he wasn't going to be the kind of king they were looking for. And so when this uh, Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem with this dubious fanfare fit for a king, although he is this humble, unking-like rabbi, it really got their goat. And so they, they boldly go up to Jesus before he gets even into the gates of Jerusalem and said, Teacher, you've got to tell your people to cease and desist. Right? Be quiet and disperse. I want you to imagine just how humbling it is for the, was for the Savior that, first of all, there would be so many people still unclear about who he is and why he had come after all he had done and said. I mean, you think you're a good teacher until you take a test, right, and you realize they all failed. And Jesus is the greatest. That's humbling, isn't it? And, and now, e even more, that, that the people he came to see, save, even these vicious foes, want nothing to do with him. That's, I would say, even humiliating. Nevertheless, Jesus continued to ride on. He was not going to acquiesce to their demands. Because you see, this was God's day. This was the day that God's great, far-reaching, all-encompassing salvation had ridden into Jerusalem, the city of David, as God had promised he would. Nothing was going to stop the joy that God had in bringing that salvation to completion. Jesus said, if the people are silent, then the rocks are going to rumble God's praise. God's salvation had visited his people, both friends and foes alike. But as I, I've already mentioned, it was so sad that, that so many of them didn't see it. Or if they heard it and saw it, they didn't even believe what they were seeing. And so St. Luke tells us that Jesus pauses going into Jerusalem and he's crying. Amid all this fanfare, Jesus is crying. And he's crying over this city of lost souls for very one simple reason. It's not that they would be destroyed. That, that he said would happen. They would in fact be destroyed by the, by the Romans who were already there. It's why. Did you hear why Jesus said they would be destroyed? They would be destroyed because they refused to believe. Now since that's true, you and I might well be wondering or asking the question, well then why would Jesus keep riding on anyway? Why not just get off the donkey at that point, throw up your hands and quit? I mean, what, what's the point in it all anymore? Friends, you are the point. Jesus kept writing because he said he would. Because God promised and prophesied that he would. You see, he had come to fight a war that no one else could fight and win. So, Next, I want you to open your eyes to the Palm Sunday irony. The one who didn't look much like a king really is. He is your Savior King. He was riding on to Jerusalem, get this, to suffer 
even greater humility and indignity. All for you. So that he could save you. So that he could bring the second great Palm Sunday, we could call it the, the, really the great paradox of the Bible, to light. And here it is. God in his righteous justice hates all sinners, but God in his grace loves all sinners. I know, they seem like opposite truths. They seem like a contradiction. They are not. This is the great paradox of the Bible's great message. It stands true like so many of the other paradoxes in Scripture because of Jesus and because he was willingly suspended on that cross. Yes, God really does hate both sin and sinner. And you know that because he doesn't promise to punish the sin. He promises or he threatens to punish sinners. However, it is just as true that God in his grace in Jesus has loved all sinners. God sent Jesus to take the sinner's place, to be sin for us, so that he, not we, suffered the divine punishment for our sins. Jesus died for those who deserved to die, so that we who deserve to die might have life instead. That's the fight and the war only this king could fight and win. And friends, as you know, that is the war and the fight he has won. On his cross, he has secured God's full and free forgiveness for every single one of your sins. He has secured for you the righteousness that you must have if you are going to enter heaven. He has opened for you the gates of life. He has freed you by his glorious resurrection from your slavery to the devil, to death, and to punishment. And because of his resurrection victory, he now stands alive right next to you. Your Jesus is standing alive right next to you. The king that we welcome on this Palm Sunday is now the king who's fought that war, he's won that war, he's come back from the dead, and he is with you right now as you face the malady, the, the struggle of your own sins, your own guilty conscience. He was there this morning to announce that forgiveness to you. He's still with you. He hasn't left you. He's still with you to help you struggle and fight against the devil and his temptations. He's still with you to help you fight against worldly, uh, deadly worldly philosophies. And even with your own sickness and death. As you embrace Jesus in all of his resurrection glory, do not be offended by, the, by his humility in his passion. Embrace him in totality as the Savior King he is. During this Holy Week, we have special opportunities to worship our Savior. Uh, Monday, Thursday in Edna, Good Friday at both campuses, next Sunday, Easter, both campuses. I, I want you to do something this week, if, if you would. I, I, I'm asking you to open to one of the Gospels, pick one, there's four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and, and just read the events of Holy Week, from his ride in Jerusalem till his resurrection. Just a even a chapter a day would have you finished before Good Friday. As you read through that this week, then humble yourselves. Humble yourselves in repentance over your many sins that made our Savior's suffering a necessity. Humble yourselves by making the time and seizing these opportunities to worship God on these special days and, and to read his word. Then, 
moved by the great things, the great love that God reveals to you in that passion history, mimic Jesus in his humility. Adopt his attitude of humility as you seek to show your love to him by loving the others around you. Especially those you don't love or like all that much. Even your enemies, just as Jesus has done. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Jesus, we stand in awe and wonder at the great ironies and paradoxes that we've witnessed in your, your triumphal entry in, into Jerusalem and, and finally in the, this holy week as the events of your suffering and death played out. We are eternally grateful and we know that eternity will not be long enough to give you thanks for the deep humility and indignities that you suffered to be our Savior. Lord Jesus, keep us ever from, become, from being offended by your humility. Teach us to embrace all of you, both our, our suffering servant and now as our glorious and risen King. We also pray then that you would work in our hearts a, a deep and abiding love for you that is willing to mimic your attitude and your life of humility as we show love to you by loving others around us. Lord Jesus, give us the strength and power to do this. In your name we ask it. Amen. <music>